and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of, the, of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Dragon's Archive Publishing, the developers of Song of Sirens, which we'll be getting into and and um, make all make all of your ship food jokes um, ahead of time. We'll we'll probably end up going through them all. One ha one half of the one one half of the four person monster that is that studio. Calvin Anderson, no Mr. Anderson jokes. He's heard them all. Yes, my name is Calvin Anderson. I'm the head writer for Song of Sirens and. The main person be behind creating the system in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we, when it actually initially started as I just saw some gaps in a lot of other tabletop RPGs I was playing at the time, and I tried to fill them with some homebrew that just ended up getting wildly out of control, and we just decided like, no, this has to absolutely be its own thing, and that's where Song of Sirens started uh, over two years ago. And for what it's worth, um, you're in good company when it comes to that kind of thing. There's plenty of games that started out as just homebrewing their way into a whole new game. Oh. But I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. <clears throat> So for me, growing up, I was very much into, you know, a lot of other generically nerdy hobbies of the time. I was very into video games and anime, and I'd heard about, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop games, but I did not know anybody who played them, and they're not a single-player game, which was even the kinds of games I liked to play at the time. I was not a multiplayer shooter kind of person. So it's just like, ah, it sounds like a neat game, but I don't know anybody who plays it, and I'm not going to figure it out on my own. So then I started, and then in college, I had a friend from one of my classes say, hey, I'm playing a game of uh, Pathfinder. I need, you know, I'm running a game. I need some more players. Would you, would you be interested in joining? I'm just like, I've never played these things before, but I'm willing to give it a try. And I got into it, and I made my first character and I fell in love with it. To me, it felt like an open, like at the beginning when I first started playing, it felt like, oh, this is like an open world game, but with infinite character customization and the, there are no invisible walls anywhere. It goes on forever and you will just generate more content for you as you keep going through the game. It's like, this is the greatest thing ever. Why, why do video games even exist when this is a thing? And from there, I was just like, I was hooked. I loved it. I loved my first ever character. I actually, thanks to my lovely wife, I have a very beautiful commissioned um, art piece of my first ever character hanging up on uh, my living room wall. So, yeah. Now, it is, it is funny you bring up the whole thing with video games because... Um, Tabletop games and video games have kind of have kind of gone hand in hand, even even back in the early days. Mm -hmm. Um, there was the there was a D, there was there was a D and D adaptation on the Play-Doh engine back in the late seventies. Um, obviously T TSR had spearheaded it in their own way with the SSI um, group that did that did a bunch of PC games. And things just things just spiraled out from that from there. Then you get stuff like wizardry. Wizardry leads to the eventual creation of Dragon Quest, and the rest is history. But I will note, since you mentioned shooters, I was that I was always that cheeky guy that ev that ev that everybody got really annoyed with, because. I was the type of person who, when playing stuff like Battlefield, would put claymores at the top of ladders. <laughs> 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 no, so some so somebody's climbing up a ladder, then they then they get blown up. Yeah, it's like for me, 
I never got into shooters because I only really had two references for shooters that neither of which really drove me towards them. That was like, number one, there was obviously, you know, all the gamer stereotypes about the people who were really into shooters. Number two, whenever I had watched other people like friends and whatnot play, you know, your typical FPS shooters like Call of Duty, Battlefield, or even Halo, most of the time they didn't look like they were having a good time. They were generally like angry and upset and getting aggravated. I'm just like, I, that's not why I play video games. I play video games to have fun and have a good time and relax. Like this game is making you angry, play a different game. So I just, there's nothing wrong with them. I just, I could never get into them because I had no positive frame of reference for them. Mm -hmm. Although we're in, we're in a good time for like, Timeline for it now with the with the resurgence of old school style shooters that don't re that don't require multiplayer and don't, and are built on dumb fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my video games were more like turn based uh, or tactical kind of RPGs like uh, Age of Empires, Civilization, um, Dragon Quest, a little bit of Final Fantasy, some of the early ones. And uh, for anybody who might actually know what it is, I absolutely adored Etrian Odyssey. I hope that's how you pronounce that. Yeah, it's, cl close um, enough. And I am very familiar with with all of them. Um, mm -hmm. I, there was a part of me that was going to wonder if you were going to bring up um, Heroes of Might and Magic and how perfectly balanced Heroes of Might and Magic Two is. You can te you can sense the sarcasm from my voice. <laughs> um, but. As I as I understand as I understand it, um, a bit of a bit of song of a bit of the concept of Song of Sirens did come from that from the trend of um, anthropomorphized um, ships, you know st stuff that we'd see in say um, Azure Lane or or the er the early the early thing would be um, Kantai Collection. Yes. So I like a lot of what those games have. It's like the anthropomorphization of, you know, the ships into, you know, girls. Like, I like that. I think that's fun. But for me, naval combat has a very specific draw. And none of those games or basically any naval game that I could find, video game or tabletop really, was able to give me my favorite aspects of historical naval combat. So I felt that I had to build my own game in order to get that specific aspect that I wanted. And what that was is more like the tension and gravity and consequences of the scenario. So I'll compare it to something like D and D, because in D and D, you know, I, I love to play, you know, you know, my martial classes and whatnot. I have a lot of fun with them. If I'm playing, you know, my fighter and we get into a really big fight in D and D, yeah, it's tense and you get into it and you're invested in the fight if the story behind it is good, because you don't want you know your character to get hurt because you're really bonded to them. But if you have a really big fight and you only survive at one HP and all of your party is fine. Just like, you rest for eight hours, and then you're good to go. Unless you used up potions or something, but even then, you can buy more. Or even if, you know, once you're above, like, level five or so in D&D, even if a party member dies, they kind of only stay dead if their player wants to make a new character, realistically, in most of the campaigns I've seen and played. But in naval combat, and this is historically, but I'll get into Song of Sirens in a second, it's like, with these ships, like, Every hit that they take, it's like there's no eight hour rest that makes it better if it's a significant hit. It could be weeks or months in port. And, in, and as opposed to with land armies or aerial combat, you know, if say a nation lost, you know, went into a big conflict and lost half of their tanks, that's not good, but you could build or buy more tanks to replace them because tanks and planes are made by like the dozens and thousands warships it takes there is the logistics thing there is the logistics thing as the russians um continue to not learn that 
you can have you mm-hmm. can have a lot of them, but getting them to the front lines that is a different matter. <laughs> yeah, because logistics is a big part in SOS as well. But it's, it's the it's like the gravity of oh, you lost a tank. It's like well, that's not great, but um, in the time it'll take us to talk about you know that tank, the factories will have made three more of that model. But with ships, if your fleet goes out and only half of it comes back, that's it. In the course of this war, you're not building that back. It's just gone. So anytime there actually is a big naval clash, there is it's so much higher stakes than any ground or aerial battle. And the fans of those, you know, no knocking to them, it's just for me, I love just like the tension and gravity that a naval combat brings because in Song of Sirens, campaigns can easily last two, four, five, ten plus years. And you can see and your entire fleet just go out and if you win even, Pyrrhic victories can be devastating in Song of Sirens because it's like, oh yay, you won, you have managed to destroy the enemy fleet, but only a quarter of your fleet makes it back okay. Cool, you can't exploit that victory. You're both just going to be rebuilding. You get to write in the history books that you won, but you're not going to gain anything out of it. So for naval combat, I love just like how much tension it can bring. And in Song of Sirens, we found that with players, they get attached to their ships very quickly, especially if they had to build them themselves with resources that they had to gather and maybe even mine themselves through special operations. And you do just like build like this, oh no, it took me, you know, like even just like a single large capital ship in game could take two, three, four years to build. And as soon as you take it out in its first engagement, that multi-year in-game investment can get destroyed in a single salvo if you're very unlucky and don't have proper protections. So it's the combat in-game is very, very engaging due to the high stakes and because you know your opponents are facing those same high stakes. And there are lots of video games that let you take these ships out and do combat with them. Um, I like Atlantic Fleet, I think it's fun. Uh, the World of Warships has a beautiful game, uh, same with Gaijin's War Thunder, their models are beautiful. And there's a Pacific Fleet as well, it's a pretty interesting one. But a lot of those just don't carry the weight. You know, just the weight of choices and consequences that I really like in historical naval warfare. So I built a system to do that since there was nothing else on the market video game or tabletop that I could find that simulated that well. And that brings me to some to something else. Um cuz I've seen I've seen plenty of games that do that have done their own take in on ship combat whether that be whether that be on on land on on sea or even in space and there are some that tr- that try and go with the idea that the part that you have one ship that is um sh- that is shared amongst the party um a rec- a example that I've covered here on the sh- on the show that does this would be Coriolis um and then on the other hand you have some games that will try to um utilize their NPC system to ha- to handle multiple ships um where in that where in that particular um pendulum does Song of Sirens fit in? So, for Song of Sirens, since this is taking place in 1930, that's the start date for 99% of campaigns, uh, at that time period, naval warfare was usually conducted by fleets operating in conjunction, so we wanted to build the combat system from the ground up with the idea of making it feasible for a player or group of players to control an entire fleet of very different warships at a time. So a lot of things on the ship will be managed by NPCs and will not be up to the player, but the individual actions of the ships are always player controlled. And if you're, say, playing a a one-on-one campaign, which the system is built to accommodate, you know, one GM, one player, because some people just don't have a really large group of friends they can get together to play with, so we want to make it possible that even just two people can play the system. 
one person could control an entire fleet of 20, 30 warships if they so desired. The combats will be pretty epic at that scale, but you know what you're getting into when you take a, a fleet of two dozen ships out. Or if you have a group of, say, two, three, four players, then whenever they go into combat, then those players will each select a segment of the fleet that will be theirs to control. And they'll need to be tactical about that because the abilities that they have will generally only affect their ships in terms of the abilities that their PC characters in Song of Sirens called Admirals have. Hmm. Because they will have abilities that affect the ship that they are specifically present on. The example I like to give is uh, there's one that it's called a captain ability. It lets your ship be especially adept at dodging torpedoes. So it's like if this is your captain ability, then your admirals up on the bridge of the ship, they see torpedoes in the water coming towards them, they rush over towards the helmsman, they shove him out of the way, and they take the wheel themselves, and they guide the ship through the torpedoes. So because they're on that ship, it's better at dodging torpedoes. Mm -hmm. But an admiral ability affects all the ships that that player controls. Like, say, maybe that player hates planes. They don't want to deal with enemy aircraft, and they hate having planes come and destroy their ships so they have an admiral ability that makes all of the aa guns on their ships more effective and that represents you know that admiral at drilling in and training into their sailors like you know i'm going to make sure that you are expert aa gunners and whenever the planes show up they talk to all the ships that they have control of and they direct their fire and yada yada because each turn in combat is two minutes instead of say six seconds so the admirals have time to be doing a lot of different things at once. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that players will be directly doing is, you know, with your ships, you get to select what their main action is and how they move in combat. So obviously you get to pick how they move, if they take any maneuvers, you know, how they're facing towards the enemy, because that matters, you know, because of what guns they can bring to bear. And then whenever you do you have your main action? It's like, are you using use it to fire your guns? If so, at who? Do you want to launch torpedoes instead? Do you want to throw up a smoke screen if you're trying to escape a battle that's not going well, maybe? There are other things that we just let the NPCs control. And I think probably the most dis divisive example is how we had to do torpedoes in-game. Because torpedoes were one of the hardest things to get working right in this game. Because, like, with their guns, it's just like, oh, yeah, uh, you pick a target, and you choose to attack them, and you roll your d20 and add all of your various modifiers, and if you hit, then we go through the stuff that happens when you hit to see how much damage, if any, you do. And if you missed, well, next turn. Hmm. But with torpedoes, it's like they don't... They're, they're not moving at a 1,000 miles per hour or whatever speed these shells are flying at. They're moving at a similar pace to the warships. So, and we didn't want to have to make players have to get out like a like a protractor and a sextant and figure out- There was a Macross out... game that tr that tried, that um, fell into that trap years ago where it would, ha where it would track individual missiles. And if you've seen firefights oh. in Macross, you can imagine how much of a nightmare that is. Yeah, I imagine they probably went through a similar dilemma, but we did not, we figured out very quickly, like, no, we're not going to make players figure out the course that the torpedoes are going to take. We've decided that is the crew's problem. Um, so basically, whenever you fire torpedoes in-game, they, as soon as they leave your ships, as long as the enemies can't see them yet, because there's a very limited range in which the enemy can actually see your torpedoes, until the enemy sees them, they are Schrodinger's torpedoes. You pick what ship you fired them at, and they move towards it, no matter what maneuvers it made, until somebody sees them. So they are heading towards the enemy ship on the map, uh, but, you know, just the player moves them towards, you know, the enemy that they said they were targeting, and just, it's a, well, how did they make it that far? Well, whatever maneuvers that ship made, the crew predicted that, until they're spotted, and then they're on a set course. Mm -hmm. So some things just like the something just like I would love to have the players control that, but that is way too complicated and causes so many metagaming issues.
So we're just like, nope, the crews just figured that out for you. So that's just an automated NPC thing. Like also like with aiming the guns, it's just like, ah, I'm not gonna make the players do any math to try and aim the guns. I played some naval games where you have to do that yourself and that's pretty fun, but ah, that was, was, combat in Song of Sirens already has enough moving parts. So just nope, the crews figure out the elevation and range and speed and all of those things. It's just, you just pick who they fire at and then the D20 and your modifiers decide if they did a good job. Now, I suppose I suppose the next angle, since since you're talking about torpedo w- torpedoes, would be um, detection. Since, well, it's well, it's hard it's hard to it's hard to target something or even get or even evade something that you can't that you can't see. And long range targeting is so is so is so much of a factor, whether it be old, whether it be mm-hmm. old school spotters or. Um, or more sophisticated forms of detection, and well, since magic is a thing in your setting, that pr- that puts another monkey wrench into this. Absolutely. So, so go ahead. Do you have do you have do you have do you have a rule set when it comes to uh, when it comes to detection? Yes, we have um, some very specific rules about detection in game. We wanted to make it simpler than some other systems. Uh, For example, World of Warships, probably the most popular ship, you know, based game online. Things like uh, you can see a battleship from, you know, whatever its detection range is away, and you can see this destroyer from a much smaller detection range or far is away. We didn't want to give each ship a different, like, detection range, because we, again, the combat system has enough moving parts. We didn't want to add in like where players have to measure, it's like, oh, is this destroyer close enough to where I can see it? So what I did is, this little peek behind the curtain, and I am a math kind of guy. I Both of my parents are college math professors, and I'm not nearly as good at math as they are, but I was not allowed to be bad at math growing up. Uh, I had no excuse. So what I actually did for detection is I took about what would be a little less than the average, like, height of, what would, what would you call probably like the crow's nest of like a large capital warship, you know, the point where all the lookouts are up, and I calculated how far away the horizon was. Because there's a, there's a formula you can use to figure that out, and it's just like, and it came out to, in-game, close to 15 nautical miles. Because in-game, the measurement is nautical miles because that's a system that can kind of unite everybody because it's something that um, people regardless of imperial or metrics use for a lot of nautical and um, aerial stuff. So 15 nautical miles away so if a ship is within 15 nautical miles of another ship then they are considered to have line of sight to each other as long as there are no obstacles physically blocking the way like if there was a big craggy island or a smoke screen or some of the magics can produce um, like magical type darkness or things like that to obscure things and so long as they are within that 15 nautical miles they can see each other because we figured that was historically realistic enough that it's not going to break anybody's immersion but it was one of those things where we simplified it down so that it didn't make the game unplayable because that was the constant battle in this system Mm -hmm. balancing i have to make it historically accurate enough that the people who love history and get this game because they love history and warships are going to have their immersion broken by having it be super arcadey but on the other hand if i make it perfectly historically realistic it's absolutely unplayable and awful and every turn for every ship in combat would take 10 minutes and nobody would be having fun, but it'd be a perfect simulator, and that's not what we wanted to do. We had, we really tried to find that perfect balance. I've seen the end point of, ch- of chasing simulation, and I want no part of that. Yes, but it, it is, however, possible to target and fire at targets beyond line of sight. Hmm. And you actually brought up the primary way you need to do that. You need to have somebody spot for you. That's either going to be many ships, especially large capital ships that can actually fling shells more than 15 nautical miles, will come equipped with spotter aircraft and they can launch them and 
for every spotter you have up in the air, you can pick an enemy target, and that thing is now spotted no matter how far away it gets. Mm -hmm. As long as it's still in combat. Or if, say, you know, you have a group of screens, like destroyers or light cruisers or something, that are within 15 nautical miles of your target, they can spot it for you as well. Yeah. Now, that brings... Given the nature, given the nature of the game, and it being called Song of Sirens, um, you have put in the implication that magic is go is going to be a bit of a factor. Um, how how much does ma how much does magic change things? Because I I get the feeling you are not doing something something like the Vancian model of of spell casting within this system. No, the magic in this system. It does have an inspiration, but it's not one a lot of people are going to be familiar with. There was a video game I played that was a really big inspiration for me when I was uh, very young <clears throat> called Artanelico, specifically the Artanelico 2. And I'm very familiar with game, Artanelico. Oh, then if you like it, then you're going to you're going to love what I have to say. Mm -hmm. So there's the song magic in Artanelico and I loved that magic system. I was fascinated. It's still probably my favorite magic system in a, a fictional world um, of any you know video game that I've played. And I want to do something like that in this game because I thought it made sense anyway. It's like they're sirens. What are sirens most famous for? Their songs. So the what you will have in game are NPCs called sirens. Mm -hmm. And there's all different types of them that we can get into if you'd like. There are a huge variety of them. But what they'll all mechanically do is that you take one of those sirens and you will be able to have them harmonize to a warship. Think about it like attuning to a magic item in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. So they pick their ship and it will be their singular ship. It's one to one. Uh, and they attune to it and then once they have harmonized with that ship, then they can sing hymns that will affect that ship. And primarily, whenever they sing hymns, it will be buffs to the ship that they are attached to. Some hymns may have debuffs for enemies that are within range or may create environmental effects that can affect all allies, but most hymns are, they affect the specific ship the siren is attuned to. The major exception being, if you get enough sirens together, and you have an especially strong one there to lead them, they can even form like a choir together, is what it's called in game. And then the effect range of their hymns balloons out to a massive degree, and you can have hymns affect entire fleets of ships, even if only, say, half a dozen or so have sirens attached to them. Mm -hmm. So, with, the, with that in mind, uh, you have... You you obviously are aiming for a variety of of different types of sirens, but since since it ha since this is something that you can't you can't put every potent every um possible entry at at once, you can't you kind of have to have some degree of standardization when it comes to archetypes. What could you tell me about the major archetypes within the sirens? So, the two most defining features for Sirens is all Sirens, regardless of whether or not they're Italian angels, or French fairies, or Japanese funayure, or whatever, is they're all divided into lesser Sirens and greater Sirens. Greater Sirens can attune to any warship they want, but they're far more powerful and far more difficult to get, so usually players are only going to put them on capital ships, say, battleships, battle cruisers, and fleet carriers. Lesser sirens are limited to smaller warships, so they can only do destroyers, light cruisers, heavy cruisers, and escort carriers. Mm -hmm. So typically, like, if you had, like, an end game sort of fleet, you might have two, three, four greater sirens, then maybe up to six, eight, ten-ish lesser sirens. You know, more players, you probably have more sirens, but it can be a give or take. And the greater sirens are always much, much more difficult and dangerous to try and summon. As with only one nation's exception, 
summoning these sirens involves either it, it's either a very costly process or it's a very dangerous process. For example, German sirens are Valkyries, and part of the process a German admiral has to go through in order to get the Valkyries to become sirens that they can use and actually have the Valkyries listen to them and obey orders is they have to defeat them repeatedly in duels. And if you lose that duel, you are going to be in the hospital and completely indisposed for a number of weeks. And Lesser Sirens, it's a fairly easy body check DC to defeat them in a duel, but Greater Sirens, they can put you in a hospital for a month if you roll particularly poorly in your duel with them. So that's the primary difference between them. A lot of the other differences are mostly flavor. So if you had, say, uh, a French vampire or an Italian archangel, you know, if you had both of them in your fleet, they probably won't really like each other, but what hymns they can learn and how effectively they can sing them, there's not a significant difference in any way. Uh, and they'll have slightly different stats based on the if you're taking the average stat distribution for the sirens, but really the only solid mechanical difference is if they're lesser or greater. Mm -hmm. Because it was intended that it is possible to capture enemy sirens in game. Say, you know, if a siren's attached to a ship and that ship um, detonates or some other terrible thing happens to it and that siren fails their body check to remain conscious after that event then it may be possible to scoop them up after the battle if you're victorious and have <clears throat> and have a, a fleet of many different kinds of sirens. There's even a title for it you can get in game if you can get enough different kinds of sirens to all work together in one fleet you can get the uh, title of Chimera Mm-hmm and since since you've brought some of the different nationalities, I I think that's one thing to tackle. Since you mm -hmm. you mentioned this be, it's you described this as a World War One and Two naval um, TTRPG. The but the thing the thing about that is when we look at the naval do, the naval doctrines in World War One versus World War Two, they are very different from very different from each other so my question is um which which way do, which way would you say that this le that this leans more towards so it definitely leans more towards the late interwar and early world war ii uh to late world war ii period but there are many ships that were built and participated in World War I in the system, uh, especially in some nations' starting fleets. Because you get to start out with a certain number of ships at the beginning, but in most navies, a lot of those ships are very outdated and clunky to try and use. So, like you said, because many of the doctrines were so different in World War I, when you're starting out with World War I-style veteran ships, it's it just feels really off and you could, especially if you've played campaigns before and you've seen what like the higher level more modern ships can do you know exactly how terrible these are and it gives players a very good impetus of, i gotta replace these as quick as possible mm -hmm. i can't possibly you know go up against somebody with these hunks of junk i gotta get rid of these uh because some navies kind of don't start out great and then just kind of flounder on unless they can get a hold of some foreign designs. Some of them start out amazing and then don't improve very well. And some of them have absolute zero to hero arcs and go from being particularly terrible at the beginning of the game and just there's almost nothing salvageable about their starting fleet to at the end of the game, uh, if you have all, you know, end game tier ships, then their fleet is absolutely monstrous and nigh unstoppable. So it varies a lot. So every starting nation is different, both because of the bonuses you get and because the fleets and how they improve or don't improve uh, makes a really big difference in game. Mm -hmm. 
So given given that, um, I would I would kind of like to get a get a feel for each of each of the nations that are that are brought up on the main site, as far as as far as what their stat what their status is at the be get at the beginning of this of where the um, player characters would be st would be stepping in, um, starting with the Empire of Japan. Yes, perfect. That's just who I was hoping you were going to bring up first. So, for the Empire of Japan, uh, and since we'll go through all of them, uh, I'll go through another little thing that's about them as well. Each of, Since there were seven great powers of the time, we kind of looked at it and we realized it fit pretty well, so we also, because each of these nations are the worst versions of themselves, because there were a lot of nations that were really not great places to be in 1930, we found the easiest way to make players uh, comfortable playing any nation they want is we made all of them terrible in their own unique ways, and all of these nations are just kind of the worst versions of themselves. Some of them don't have a lot of room to get much worse, uh, and some of them have a little bit more room to get worse. Uh, so we assigned each of them one of the seven deadly sins. So Japan is the, the sin of lust, and they are the unholy dragon. In turn, uh, which is the kind of a, a moniker that they get in game because of who and what they are. So, if you're starting as Japan, your starting fleet is very top heavy. You get to start out with, um, I think it's more than anybody else, with five capital ships, two battleships, two fleet carriers, and a battle cruiser. I think they're the only nation that starts out with one of each of the three types of capital ships. I don't think any other nation gets to start out with all three. Um, and the, the Fuso class battleships, Soryu class fleet carriers, and Congo class battle cruisers. And all three of those, by starting fleet standards, are pretty good. Obviously, they're outclassed by later game ships, but all three of those are pretty good. They're smaller ships, they're screens not as good. They're going to want to be replaced as soon as possible. So if you're starting out as Japan and you get into, you know, a, a brawl of capital ships where, you know, your large gun capital ships are brawling with some enemies, large gun capital ships, and it's all starting fleet ships, there's only two nations in game that can kind of stand up to you. So you start out with great capital ships, not so great screens. And for some of the bonuses Japan gets, Japan, well, they do have very, very good ship designs, and they start out with pretty good technology. Their industry is not great. So the economy supporting those ships that they use to build more of them and afford more technology to get even better ships is not very good. So if you're playing as Japan, one thing you might want to try and do is see if you can acquire more shipyards for yourself. Just the problem is getting shipyards is extraordinarily expensive. There's, like, it's almost impossible to build a ship that'll be more expensive than building a shipyard. So they're prohibitively expensive, as they should be. <laughs> there, there shouldn't be a tank that costs more than the tank factory, so my, why shouldn't it be anything else? Yeah. Um, and for Japan, some of the other bonuses... Oh, uh, Japan is very good at managing the mutiny level of their sailors. Because you do, as the Admiral, have to manage basically... Because these fleets, they're primarily crewed by 18 to 25-year-olds. And they're trapped in metal boxes in the middle of the ocean with nothing to do. And that is a recipe for disaster. So you have to manage the sailors in your fleet. And how willing to listen to you they are is... Uh, tracked in your fleet mutiny level. And Japan has a lot of good means for managing it. It's very easy to keep a very low mutiny level as Japan, unless you have to run away, in which case they'll turn on you really quickly. So it's feast and famine. Mm -hmm. And... Oh, and the last, I think, most important thing about playing as a Japanese admiral is unfortunately... Japanese admirals are the poorest. So if you were playing as a Japanese admiral, your salary is terrible, and the means for you to get more money through corruption are more limited than the other admiral that has a terrible salary. So it's it's difficult to 
play by the rules and have any amount of money as an admiral in Japan, which is bad because you need money both for, say, buying gifts or taking people you really care about out on dates as a way to boost your relationship with them, and you need it to schmooze and bribe politicians to do things like build new shipyards for you or increase your salary or increase your navy budget and things like that. Mm -hmm. So next would be the French Third Republic. Yes, so whenever I was talking about the Zero to Hero earlier, that is the French Third Republic. They're referred to in-game as the Wilting Al Rayoun, and they have the deadly sin of pride. And that is because, though they have a very decent start with technology and industry, they, they have the worst starting fleet in the game. I'm sorry to say it, but it's just true. They have World War I-style battleships in the Corvées, and they weren't even good World War I style battleships. Um, the Duquesne class cruisers they start with have, there are plenty of light cruisers in game that have better armor than the Duquesnes. And it, they, the bonuses that they get by having almost no armor do not make up for the fact of how frail they are. Um, their light cruisers and destroyers are okay for the start. Uh, they're not gonna be outdated for a good couple of years. And they do start with one aircraft carrier, but it's debatably the worst fleet carrier in the entire game. Mm -hmm. If you can survive the early game with all of your terrible, terrible ships, some of the late game French ships like uh, Dunkirk class, uh, the Richelieu class, the Mogador class, some of those are amazing and are very, very difficult to bring down in a fight. I think the Richelieu yeah, the Richelieu class battleships in game, in my opinion, in terms of their displacement, are the toughest ships to kill in game, ton for ton. The mm -hmm. best protected, especially if you give them like a full protection build and giving them some special upgrades to protect them from torpedoes and aircraft and things, uh, other things that can destroy them besides shell fire as well. Mm -hmm. So if you equip your Richelieu's properly, they are floating fortresses and very hard to get rid of. Yep. And one other neat thing is that in-game, whenever you build a new class of ship, it is possible that even through your Admiral's best efforts, there may be unforeseen defects that these ships can have. Say, where they were designed to have a gun range of, you know, this far, but uh, it's not, it can't quite make it. Or they were, uh, or there was an oversight in their secondary armament and they don't have enough ammunition to fire for more than five rounds or maybe the armor is weaker than it was supposed to be and there can be any number of defects because it was very historically accurate especially for the time period if you're if you don't like defects however the french partially because of their whole thing about pride their ships always take longer to build than ships of other nations but they come out with fewer defects so if you do not like uh, the stress of having a new expensive class of capital ship come out and worrying that it may have a lethal defect and being French is a good way to reduce those defects by a significant margin. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the better parts of playing as France yep. is uh, lower defects because defects can be terrifying. Mm -hmm. So next would be the German Reich. And I do want to clarify something about this. For each of these nations, we do use what their legal name was for them at the time. Japan was the Empire of Japan. France was the French Third Republic. And at the time, Germany was legally called the German Reich in 1930. But in 1930, they were still the democratic Weimar Republic. So if players... Whenever you start as Germany in 1930, unless your GM has accelerated the timeline of things, the, it is still a democratic republic, but with a sizable minority of extremists and nationalists attempting to seize power. That's just something I always like to clarify for Germany, uh, because that is a misconception whenever they see that name. As whenever the, whenever it did, you know, have a change in parties, the legal name of the country didn't change. So that's what it was before any of the other stuff that happened in World War II. So that's just something I'd like to clarify for people. 
-hmm. If they want to play as, you know, a certain red and black group, you can in game. Like, you can buy the book, you can do whatever you want with it. I'm not going to stop you if you want to play that out, play them, play as them or play against them. But if you are choosing to play as Germany, that is not a requirement for playing as Germany. In game, they are known as the Deathless Leviathan. <clears throat> and they also are commonly referred to um, as a Hydra as well, because Germany, you just can't keep Germany down. If, the, if, if history has taught us anything about Germany, it's just like there's no way to get rid of it unless you're going to salt its fields like Roman did with the Carthaginians. So with Germany, you do unfortunately again start out with a pretty weak set of starting ships. The, their battleships are World War I era and some of the worst starting ships in the game. Their battle cruisers, about the same. Their heavy cruisers, the same. Light cruisers are really small and weak. The destroyers aren't bad. Mm -hmm. But Germany starts out with a very weak fleet. Germany has one of the strongest industrial bases in games. So you have a very, very strong economy as Germany. And one of the nice benefits of that is German admirals are paid better than the admirals of any other nation in game by a wide margin. If you want to play a game where you are rolling in money, play as a German admiral. Mm -hmm. You make so many Reich marks, especially because your salary is not only affected by, you know, how many raises you've managed to convince the politicians to give you. It's also affected by your standing, which represents how much the government likes you because of how good or bad of a job that you're doing. And if your standing goes up as a German admiral, your salary spikes even higher. Because one thing about Germany is they have a very powerful industry, but they haven't been able to leverage that to military success, both to a certain degree in history and especially in the alternate history of Song of Cyrus. Mm -hmm. Prove that you are actually a person is willing to throw money at you to just mm -hmm. and, uh, get a breath of air. Yeah. So, yes, you do. You. You meant, I think. I think in the process of this, you skimmed over which of the seven deadly sins they're they're akin to. Oh yes, wrath. Oh, inter interesting. So next would be the kingdom of Italy. Italy is a strange one in game. They start out with the weakest economy of any of the seven. Only one close to them is Japan. They we refer to them in game as the bygone Nephilim. Uh, because they are always longing for the bygone era of the Roman Empire as we portray them as envy in-game, as they are always jealous of some of the other powers around them and longing to return back to a time when they were the premier power of the Mediterranean. Whereas now they have to share that with France and England, who isn't even a nation that borders the Mediterranean but has probably more power there than they do. Mm -hmm. oh, as an Italian admiral, one of the funny things about playing an Italian admiral is the sirens in game. Even though they are these very like magical and wondrous creatures, he tried to take a realistic and kind of funny approach to what we thought would actually happen if these sirens were real. So we thought, hmm, what would these empires do if they found out? that there were magical creatures in the world that if they could get them and have them support their ships, that it could make their ships so much better than enemy ships just on a snap of the fingers and just give them a big advantage. So I thought, they're immediately going to try and hunt them down and catch them and bind them to ships and be absolute monsters about it and industrialize magic and just tear all of the nice things apart to get a, sl a slight military advantage. But Italy is weirdly the only country in Song of Sirens where sirens have actual human rights because in Italy, sirens manifest as angels and archangels and as at uh, the time, I believe, about 95% of Italians were practicing Catholics. The idea of doing that to angels would never have sat well with the public. 
So being an Italian admiral, instead of trying to like capture sirens and force them to obey you and get them under your control, you know, as if they're, you know, some kind of war beast, Italian, Italian admirals have to convince them and beg for their help and plead with them. So as an Italian admiral, you're actually working jointly with your sirens by force in any other nation you can choose to be you know a better person and not follow traditions and have very friendly relationships with your sirens and treat them like people it's very encouraged in game and there are benefits to doing so but in italy it's the only nation where you don't really get a choice if you treat your sirens poorly in italy there are mechanics in game that will make the public turn on you and you'll get in a lot of trouble if you misuse your sirens in italy mm-hmm as for their fleet, uh, just across the board, it's not great. The best thing they have going for them is within a year of playing an Italian Admiral, if you just get one or two good technologies for your heavy cruisers, you can build some of the best heavy cruisers in game. And way later on, you can get a decent battleship, but there, there's a lot of gaps in the Italian fleet. you got to be kind of clever to fill in. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of the fun part about playing as Italy. And if you're playing an Italian campaign, you can play them as World War II-style fascist Italy or more Song of Sa- Song of Sirens canon uh, theocratic Italy. Mm-hmm. Those uh, are both options. So, yes, in the canon of Song of Sirens, they are a theocratic nation where you'll be answering to the Pope as much as you'll be answering to the King. But if players want to go more... You know, World War II style realistic, they can uh, have them be a fascist nation instead. It's player preference, but the canon of Song of Sirens is that they're theocratic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, so it's essentially a, the, essentially a a theocracy in all but name. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Technically, the king and the parliament are in charge by law. But the Pope wields as much or more political power than they do. So in Italy, your attentions as the Admiral are split three different ways. You answer to the King because he's technically the one in charge of the country. You answer to the people because if they hate you, the Pope and the King will be forced to replace you in order to keep their power. And you answer to the Pope because even though he doesn't technically have any authority over you... He wields more political power in the country than almost anybody else as the head of the church. So having him hate you is a very quick way to make your life unnecessarily difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, So next on the list would be the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Yes, our frozen titan and the deadly sin of sloth. And that actually comes from the history of both Soviet and Tsarist Russia. So we picked Sloth for them because it, in the history of Russia, we everybody knows that Russia and vodka have a long history together, but the extent to which the two are intertwined is not known by many people. So what the Russian czars did for many centuries is they and the nobility exclusively controlled the right to bottle vodka and they made it cheap and available to the peasantry of Russia, both as a means to generate wealth for the state and the nobles, but also as a means to keep the people controlled and this is a very well-documented thing in Russian history, it just makes sense. If the vast majority of the Russian peasantry spends all of their money on vodka and then gets themselves, you know, knock out drunk every night, well, now they're both too poor and too drunk to, you know, lead a revolt against the Tsars, and the Tsars can kind of do whatever they want with Russia and not really have to worry about the consequences. Mm -hmm. So one funny and ironic thing about when the Soviets took power uh, post-World War I is when the the Communist Party first arose in Russia, it was a dry party. They were against alcohol. They wanted to ban alcohol in the country prohibition style because they saw it as a tool 
that the Tsar was using to control people. And they were right. But you don't hear about that because whenever the Soviets did take power, they, from my understanding, they did shut down all the bottling plants. They did, you know, destroy, you know, thousands or millions of gallons of vodka and, you know, drain it away. And it was this big victory. But then once they were in control a little bit longer and the whole absolute power corrupts absolutely started to set in as it as it will they opened them back up and they started using them to control the people in more or less the exact same way that the SARS did but in Song of Sirens everything has to be the worst versions of themselves so the Soviets in Song of Sirens said well he did say that all this about vodka but we don't want to be exactly like the Tsar, but we do still want to sell this vodka. I know. Let's, um, since we're a modern party, we're going to do that, but we're going to do it even better. And so not only did it reopen the bottling plants, they also just began manufacturing a lot of other kinds of illicit substances as well. So in Song of Sirens, a lot of the soldiers in the Soviet army are going to be on some kind of stimulant, and a lot of the people who aren't working some sort of physical job or in the military will be on some kind of depressant to keep the people even more controlled so that's why we picked sloth for them because they're constantly trying to keep their populace which has proven they have the ability to rise up in armed revolt and overthrow the government because they just did that mm -hmm. trying to keep them down and depressed and controllable so when you mention stimulant have you ever heard the legend of Aimyo um, Koivunen I probably mispronounced his name I have not heard that. Please enlighten me. <laughs> this was the man who... This was this is one of the... A particularly infamous um, World War II story. Imo had... Ta had... Um, ta had... Had, ta had taken... Had taken a kind of stimulant that was given to... Uh, to give to, That was given to other soldiers. Um... What what was not known was that he was that he because he was going to be doing the long haul he fe he felt he was going to need to take more of it he took all of it that it, that it, that the company had but that stimulant was even though it was called like dervatin at the time it was meth yeah <laughs> he, I know he took meth all, World War II. he took all he took all the damn meth and became nearly unkillable. Oh, that's really funny. And playing as the Soviets in Song of Sirens, it, it, it is, there's so many ups and downs. Like the upside is the Soviets can build ships faster than almost anybody else with a shipyard. They get a big bonus to building their ships really quickly. But it comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. And that cost is that they're the opposite of France. France gets fewer defects than everybody else. The Soviets get way more. So you get to build ships very, very quickly as the Soviets, but all of them come out with a bunch of different defects that you have to fix later, assuming that it's a defect that can even be fixed. Yeah. On oh. top of that, as a Soviet admiral, your pay is terrible, but your pay is terrible because they assume that you're going to be corrupt and take your payment from other things anyway, so they don't bother paying you because they assume that your corruption is going to be your real salary, which is also fairly historically accurate. <laughs> so as a Soviet admiral, you technically make terrible money, but theoretically your salary is infinite as long as you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And for Soviets, unfortunately, for Song of Sirens, we do have over 200 historically accurate ships studded out in-game. But in World War II, there were not a lot of completed Soviet designs for us to put in the game. Uh, especially in larger ships. Lots of great destroyers. Lots of great light cruisers. Um, stuff bigger than that, there's not a lot. But uh, what you can do in-game and what we recommend that you do is, if you're playing the Soviet Union have at least one other major power as an ally and buy designs from them. Because there is nothing stopping you from, uh, say, um, buddying up with uh, France or Japan and buying designs to those ships and then building them faster and debatably worse in the Soviet Union. <laughs> well, uh, 
given 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 some recent tank designs, history has a way of being a, of being a flat circle. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. No, give, given how given how a a um a more re a tank a tank design that came, that that came out of that came out a few decades ago was using a was was using a um cl debatably a clone of a of a World War II German design. One uh, that was I know what you're talking about. Yes, I, I'm aware of that uh, controversy. <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, a a design that everyone knew that everyone knew was unreliable, and then they acted surprised when it turned out to be unreliable. Yeah, cause it, it is one of those things. Just like there are like, playing as the Soviets is really fun in some ways and really terrible in some other ways. So it is a very interesting nation to play in game. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's just there's just so much fun to be had. Oh, also, they, it is possible to have addictions in game. Uh, we have one for each of the seven deadly sins, uh, and the Soviet admirals are the only ones who are required to start with an addiction. Mm -hmm. You get to pick your poison, but you have to start with one. Yeah, but you do get to pick your poison. You do, so, you do. You can pick, you know, it could be something really simple, like, you know, cigarettes. Uh, it could be gambling. Um, it, it could be, like, vanity with lots of jewelry or whatever. It's like, but you have to start with one. But you can always overcome them in-game uh, if you don't like them. And if you do overcome an addiction in-game, there is even a title for it. Mm -hmm. So, next up on the list would be the United Kingdom of Great Britain. All right, yes, they are the bleeding god, uh, and their sin is avarice. So they are the bleeding god in game because at, in 1930, especially in Song of Sirens, where the world is 95% water, the UK is the king of the world. It's not, it's not debatable. Yes, there are other nations that are very, very powerful, like the United States, Germany, and to a certain extent, Japan. But the UK out just absolutely outshines all of them. There is no one nation in Song of Sirens that could reasonably fight the United Kingdom one-on-one -on -one and expect to win unless, you know, the admirals controlling their fleets had vastly different skill levels. So, how uh, Steiner... They, what was that? House Steiner in Battletech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like trying to fight uh, the UK at the beginning of the campaign, especially, would be like trying to fight Lu Bu at the beginning of Dynasty Warriors. It's just like, don't do it. It's not worth your time. It's a terrible idea. Because not only do they make way more money than everybody else and have a decent number of shipyards, and they can get way more if they uh, want to with some of the in-game mechanics, and they get more fuel, and they get more steel, the other two key resources. On top of all of that, not only do they have more resources than everybody, there are some nations, like, I think you could probably combine the incomes of the two lowest-ranking um, major powers together, and it wouldn't be as many total resources as England gets on their own. Not only, on top of all of that... Their ship designs start out better than everybody else's. The only two countries that can maybe go toe-to-toe -to -toe with British battleships at the beginning of the game are the American um, New York class and the Japanese Fuso class. Mm -hmm. That is a relatively even fight. Anybody else, it's a bloodbath. You, you could go two or three to one, and the British battleships would still absolutely trounce them due to uh, just a number of things that are just better. They're Guns are several inches bigger, they have longer range, their armor is more effective, just everything that matters is just better. They start out with battleships, they get a battle cruiser that's pretty good too, they get a really good escort carrier. Their heavy cruisers start out pretty good, and their light cruisers and destroyers aren't great, but capital ships are, tend to be the ones that swing the tides of combat in large fleet engagements. Mm -hmm. So just they have every possible advantage in game what's the catch so, the catch is that they the catch is that they have everything which means they have everything to lose yes they do have all of this great stuff 
But if you just take England itself, that tiny little island, if just the island by itself, it is not better than many of the other major powers. And it's way weaker than countries like Germany or America in terms of like their core territory. The island of England is not powerful. It's the fact that they control a quarter of the entire world that makes them this giant unstoppable monster. That also means you may have to fight a conflict across the entire world. As soon as one country goes to war with you, it's not, because if you say go to war with Germany, Germany starts out with no colonies. If you want to attack Germany, you have to go to Germany. So Germany, if they're on the defensive, all they have to do is defend Germany. That's it. England, uh, to give you a list of what they had at the time, they would even basic geography can tell you like how many different places there are. So not only there's England, you know, up in Europe, they also control Australia, Canada, uh, Ceylon, which is an island, large island south of India, mm -hmm. Egypt, India itself, Iraq, Malaysia, South Af and South Africa. So if you are England and you go to war with even one country, you may have to fight in Europe, North America, Africa, and Asia simultaneously. Four different continents. So the enemy can attack you anywhere and you have to defend all of these places at once because as england every time you lose a colony you lose a lot of resources and if you don't have those colonies to bolster up your home islands england is weak a lot of different countries could take on england if it was just core territory to core territory i'm not even sure england would be in the top three of the major powers honestly but since they have that huge empire it makes them you know, a giant effectively, but there's so many ways to strike at them. So it's a stressful thing that you have to manage this huge empire. And things that can even happen in game is even if nobody attacks you, those colonies can revolt if you do not keep a steady enough hand on them. There are means in game for colonies you control to just rise up against you randomly without you even knowing something was brewing. You know, they hit it very well. Every time that you go out on some kind of sortie that lasts a long enough period of time and then come back. There's a mechanic in game called the world event chart where you roll a D100 and there's a hundred different major world events that just like, a, oh, you were gone for three months of what happened while you were gone sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And one that can happen is that colonies for various major powers can go up and revolt and you have a lot of different colonies that could start revolting against you and even though you have the ability to put those rebels down, that's not an if. It's not an if. You have the ability to put them down. The problem is, if that happens, say there's a big rebellion in India uh, and Ceylon, and you have to go put that down, your enemies may not be static. If somebody like, say, Japan was looking for an opportunity to invade Malaysia, and now they know that you're going to be busy putting down a huge revolt in India, now's the time to go take, you know, Malaysia. Now's the time. Mm -hmm. So you have all of the advantages, but you are spread thin, 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 thin. Mm -hmm. So, and of, co of course, last but not least, we have the United States of America. Yes. So for the United States, a you start out very powerful. But what a lot of people, especially Americans playing the system, will need to realize is that America was not the world's sole superpower at the time. This is before America's rise to becoming the world's dominant superpower. They're still a very powerful nation in game. I'd probably rank them second overall, but they're definitely in the top three. Uh, just due to their geography benefiting them greatly, just like it does you know, in the real world. So as an American admiral, you do have a lot of money and you have a lot of steel, and you have a lot of fuel. So you don't have to go anywhere to get the things that you need. You, uh, In your core territory, you have lots of steel, lots of fuel, and lots of money. Mm -hmm. Usually nations are lacking at least one of those, and some nations have a good supply of none of them. As America, you have everything you strictly need at home, and you have good ship designs. Um, the New York class battleships are pretty good. The heavy cruisers they start out with, the Pensacola and the Northamptons, they're not bad. 
Omaha class CLs are not great. And the Clemson class destroyers are unfortunately the straight up worst in the game, but it's not that hard to replace them once you get started. And they start out with a pair of um, aircraft carriers that are pretty good as well. The problem you have as an American admiral is that your government does, your government is going to be fighting against you a lot of the time. Because as an American admiral, you're kind of in two states. State number one, you want to start some kind of aggressive war. You want to expand your territory and make yourself more powerful. Maybe you want to go north into Canada, south into Mexico, maybe make some colonies down in South America. And so if you're playing as an aggressive admiral, well, then moving uphill battles, like your government doesn't want you to go out and do anything. The, the America has everything it needs in America. They don't see the need to go out and do stuff. So as an American admiral, you're just like, I have everything I need to wage all of the wars and, you know, get involved in these conflicts and do all these cool things and build all these big ships. And the government's going to go, why do we want to do that? Like, well, we can get all this stuff. Yeah, but we have stuff. God, but we want more stuff. Nah, we have stuff. It's just fine. Or alternatively, if you're playing a defensive campaign, like you as the admiral are the military mind and you see like, oh no, England is running for us. They, they saw that we were really powerful in the previous Great War, and they see that we're coming up and that Thucydides' trap is you know starting to be set, and they don't want us to surpass them as the dominant power. They are clearly coming to get us. We need to start preparing to stop them. You take that to the government, the government's got the same reaction. Nah, we'll be fine. Nah. So you're going to be fighting against your government to do the things you want, because America as a nation, is more leaning toward the dovish government than any other nation in game. Like, is it hard to convince, you know, if you're playing a German animal, is it hard to convince the government to go invade the Netherlands or Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia, something like that? No, not really. And as long as you can promise them that it's not going to end in another giant world war that they lose, the government will be, you got to spend some favors. That's just how the mechanic works, but they'll be down for it. Mm -hmm. But in America, it's like, nah, they don't want to do anything. Now, a GM could, you know, um, have a very um, hawkish American government if they want to play a particularly violent campaign. But in the canon of Song of Sirens, like, your, one of your biggest problems as an American admiral is you have everything that you need and nothing to use, nothing to use it for. <laughs> well, it, it, is, it, is fun, it is funny you mentioned that, given um, these given that it was the circumstances with France that was part of the reason why the why the US ended up joining the ended up joining the war on the allies side in the first world war mm -hmm. be, well be, because one there there were economic problems two France was still in debt to the US and three yes. um because of how much of a melting pot America had become um the the idea was well maybe we can get all these different people to get along by by giving them something to shoot at yeah absolutely and in the canon of song of sirens america is described as being extraordinarily divided and specifically since this is the worst version of america uh that division is not any sort of product of history or circumstances the government did it on purpose um whether or not that is historically accurate, I am not one to say. But in we're Song doing of Siren, alternate history, so bets are off. <laughs> yeah, all bets are off. This is alternate history. I'm not saying this is exactly what definitely happened in real life, but uh, in Song of Sirens, uh, all all the people are divided and fighting against each other and finding ways to clash against each other and letting the government and all of the big business oligarchs do whatever they want because all the people are expending their energy on things that don't matter. Or they're so stuffed full of luxury goods that they're too fat uh, to sit. They're too fat to get up and do anything, which is partly why America, no, known in game as the Awakened Giant, it has the deadly sin of gluttony because mm -hmm. I live in America. We are fat. Yeah. That is a reality. Oh. <laughs> well, I've speaking of which, I forgot to ask about the deadly sin for Great Britain. Oh yes. They are avarice because they are the ones who are determined to stick their thumb in every single pie and get a taste of everything. They own colonies on 
at least three different continents and they're dominating the continent that they live on and they bring in the most money the most stuff they take they strip everything from everyone everywhere they can and that greed goes even further in game in that the biggest difference between the united kingdom in song of sirens and in reality is has to do with um the history of the slave trade mm -hmm. because everyone knows from history that britain they definitely didn't start the slave trade but they expanded it to a certain degree and you know giving it the ability to ship everywhere overseas but and they did they participated in it and they perpetuated it just like many other nations of the time but what a lot of people don't know historically is that a lot of the reason that the slave trade got clamped down on and stopped propagating and stopped growing was because Britain spent an extraordinary amount of money to kill it. Because Britain, uh, at the time, I don't remember the exact dates, but I want to say it was in around about the 1800s, Britain decided that uh, as it, they kind of collectively came together and decided that they wanted to be anti-slavery and they ended it in their country and they paid off British slaveholders to free slaves in Britain and they uh, made laws that anyone who stepped on British soil was free and things like that. But they didn't just end it in their country. They used the fact that they were one of the absolute most powerful naval powers in the world to enforce an end to the Atlantic slave trade especially because if Britain says you can't do something in the ocean, you can't do that in the ocean anymore. Mm -hmm. And they spent exorbitant amounts of money funding their military to go in and clamp down on and suppress the slave trade in the Atlantic Ocean. And it was, to a certain extent, very successful in helping end that practice. In Song of Sirens, they didn't do that. In Song of Sirens, they continued to perpetuate slavery even up into the modern day as many nations in game still practice slavery because they are evil and they are evil versions of themselves and players are encouraged to try and make them better versions of themselves and they can't exactly make the nations better if they're already great. Mm -hmm. So we made them all terrible. So that way, like no matter what country you're in, there's something you can fix about it. Yeah. Um, I am so, curious... I'm curious from just from the just from the canon end of Song of Sirens if the presence of Sirens played a factor in say the revolutionary war given how you've described Great Britain. So, hmm, would Sirens have affected the outcome of the revolutionary war? I've never had that question posed to me before. We have a fully written canon of Song of Sirens history starting in the year 1900 up into the quote-unquote present in-game of 1930. You know, I think there's probably a good chance that they would have because I could definitely see a lot of British sirens in... What few British sirens there would have been in the Navy potentially being willing to defect because sirens were used in military conflicts in antiquity, but they didn't become super prevalent um, until post-Industrial Revolution, and especially once um, once the like ironclad era of warships began. Mm -hmm. So in the Age of Sail, they were a thing, but they were more rare because people hadn't quite refined the process of summoning and acquiring them it was still like a like a new science at the time it wasn't fully understood and then uh you know the 1800s and closing in on um the end of the you know the end of the 1800s by that point it had been around long enough that yeah everybody had figured it out everybody had a grip on it all the major powers had their means of summoning sirens and could do so there was no ifs about it it's like yeah this is how it works we know how to do this now because mm -hmm. each nation uh, summons sirens in a different way. Mm -hmm. Now, with all with all that in mind, since since we're talking about start about starting ships and then ships that you're acquiring as you advance, I am curious if you if within the book as it currently ha as it currently is, if you have some sort of tech tree that d that um details that that details that or some way of summarizing that sort of advancement. Yes. Uh, 
he tried to keep it fairly simple because naval technology is inherently a really wonky, complicated thing. And we wanted to try and make it as simple as our players, uh, simple for our players as we could without removing the historical accuracy. So basically, in game, you can build any ship that you want, but what technology you have access to limits their capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I have America pulled up in front of me as an example, so I can take a look at them. Uh, for example, uh, in American ships, uh, looking at their battleships, they have New York class battleships. The battleships they start out with have 14 inch guns in twin turrets. Mm -hmm. So you can build, you know, new, more New York class battleships if you want. But if there's another ship that you want to build, uh, another battleship you want to build, you could also build that. But if that ship has guns that are bigger than 14 inches, you can't build that ship until you have the technology to build 15 inch guns. Mm -hmm. Or if you have the guns that you want to build for that ship, you may also need to be able to make armor plates thick enough to protect it. Um, so the main stop gaps for building any ship you want, you know, to prevent something like um, having the Japanese try and build a Yamato class battleship in 1930, which they should by no means not be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, you are blocked by the size of the guns on the warship, the turrets that they're placed in, the armor that the ship has protecting its bow, stern, and sides, basically the front, back, and sides of the ship for our viewers. Uh, and one of the biggest ones, especially for capital ships, is displacement. Because just because you want to build a ship that weighs 70,000 tons like the Yamato, and even if you have large shipyards, because they are tracked differently than regular shipyards, that can build ships in excess of 30,000 tons, it doesn't mean, just because your ships can build ships larger than 30,000 tons, doesn't mean that they can immediately build a 70,000 ton behemoth like a Yamato. Mm -hmm. So things like whenever you're researching your displacement, you're not only having your scientists figure out how to build a hull that can displace that much and know how to build it and make it a good construction and make it a viable warship and this, that, the other. It's also representative of you expanding your shipyards to the point where your large shipyards specifically to the point where they can handle that or say for researching gun size, because whenever you research 18 inch guns, it's not as simple as, you know, Oh, well just, you know, take your 17 inch guns and, you know, whittle out the barrel a little bit. Now they're 18 inches. So we'll know now you also need 18 inch ammunition you're going to have to test that and make sure that it functions properly. And then you're going to have to build a factory that can actually make the ammunition. And you may have multiple ammunition types you use in game and yada, yada, yada. So whenever you pay for technology and then there you pay for technology with money, experience. And then you once you pay those two costs, there's a like a time limit. Basically, it's like, OK, you've paid everything you need for the technology. It's going to be done in 40 weeks or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, and that represents not only getting the physical capabilities to do X, Y, Z thing, but also proving that it works effectively and getting all of the logistics that you need to support that new technology should you start using it as well. So it's not a flat tech tree. It's more like, oh, to build this ship, I need... Uh, I'll use a ship may, some people might be uh, familiar with. If you want to build an Iowa-class battleship for America... You can, but to build an Iowa, you're going to need, um, I think she caps out at 12 inch armor plates. So you need uh, 12 inch armor plates, displacement um, in excess of 60,000 tons, 16 inch guns, and the ability to put those 16 inch guns in triple turrets. Mm -hmm. And also you need to be able to make sure that oh, there's also propulsion and you'll need to be able to make sure that you can build a large capital ship that can exceed, you know, 33 knots, which is, uh, I think her top speed is 33 knots. But, but hey, if you have the technology to build a 60,000 ton warship, have it move, you know, uh, 33 plus knots, and you can fit 16 inch guns on it in triple turrets, and you can give her 12 inch armor plates, if you have the capabilities to do all of those individual things, you can build an Iowa class. 
Mm -hmm. So it's less that you go from ship to ship to ship in a tech tree, like in civilization or something like that. It's more just, okay, I want to build this ship. What technologies do I need to have in order to build it? So you can just ignore entire parts of tech tree if you don't want to deal with it. If you don't want to spend a ton of money researching carriers, you can just not research carrier specific technologies. But if you change your mind later, a lot of the technologies you need for other capital ships also overlaps with carriers. So you can just then only go for the carrier specific ones when you find out you desperately need them later. Mm -hmm. Now, I will, I, although I will admit when I was thinking, I, when I was using tech tree, I was using that as a, um, as as a as a catch-all because this could just as well apply to how you how you upgrade your, how you upgrade your stuff in say um, Total War or or even something more freeform like the Endless series, which for the record, en Endless Legend and Endless Space are really damn good. <laughs> um, but moving moving past that, I I did see the um the mock-up character sheets that you have on your site and i see that you have a set of abilities for admiral and for captain um so what what would what is the dividing what is the dividing line between the two so captain abilities affect the ship that your pc character is specifically on because you do have to track that in game because, say, if you're on that ship and that ship suffers a magazine detonation or the superstructure, which is where you are, is hit by enemy shell fire, you may have to roll, you know, some body checks to see if you take injuries or, in worst case scenario, die. Mm -hmm. So, in-game, whenever your fleet is sailing, you have to keep track of what ship you are physically present on. And your captain abilities for your Admiral, your PC character affect the ship you are physically present on and it represents that whenever you are on that ship what are you able to specifically command that crew to do to make them better at or what can you specifically do that uh makes a ship better at doing something mm -hmm. for example you might have a captain ability that increases the accuracy of your guns so it's just that you know whenever that ship is using its range finders and aiming at the enemy, you're like right down in there and you're hearing, you're like listening in on their aiming and you're giving the directions like, oh no, no, move it down another 10th of a degree, uh, move it you know to the right just a little bit more and give it more lead. I think it's moving faster and you're like in there telling them, giving them advice on how to do it so that makes your ship better at doing that thing. Mm -hmm. Admiral abilities come in two forms. Either A, it's an ability that affects your entire fleet due to how you manage them, or it's something that your character has personally. So an example of an Admiral ability and how it affects the entire uh, fleet could be something like... Uh, this is, let me make sure that I give a good example. So examples of an Admiral ability that affects your fleet uh, would be Rule the Waves. So whenever you use that ability, you can use an Admiral response, similar to like a reaction in D&D, &D, mm -hmm. uh, and increase the attack rolls of all of your ships by two. And that would be like the example I just gave with you getting into the nitty gritty of the accuracy of your ship, but you're doing that with the entire fleet. You're specifically guiding in their salvos, and Admirals are extraordinarily talented and powerful, and they're basically, by using that ability, like for the next two minutes, you're primary focus is watching the shells of where all of your ships land and you are guiding in their fire and homing it in for that entire two minute turn mm -hmm. but admirabilities can also affect like just yourself uh one that a lot of people like to take especially if they don't have a high body stat is tough as nails and what that ability does is it makes it so that no matter how bad your body check rolls are should you have to make them from, say, your ship detonating or uh, exploding from the superstructure hitting zero or what have you, your character won't die. They can still take injuries and maybe even lose a limb or get some shrapnel scars or burn scars or whatever, but they'll never die. Mm -hmm. So, because I have had some bad experiences with GMs that to kill player characters and i don't know why that's that's their thing but they have it 
and or just players who just like I really get attached to my characters and it makes me really sad when they die. So I've had some experiences with that and we're just you yeah, don't we want call the, we call them that guy or that yeah, GM. Exactly. Yeah, that DM. So, you know, for players who get really attached to their characters or for players who know that their GM likes to kill players cuz it's the only GM that they have and that's just what they have to deal with. Or for people who want to dump their body stat but don't want to die partway through the campaign, you have an ability, tough as nails, you take it, like, you know, don't, don't gain any benefit to combat or getting favors or anything like that, but can't die. Another uh, one that is very popular is uh, Political Darling. So one of the things you have to do in-game in order to get the stuff you need, you have to get the government to do stuff for you, like raising your Navy budget, giving you a personal salary increase. You have to get your Navy, you have to get your country's government to sign off on new classes of capital ships because they're so expensive. Doing all of that requires favors. In Song of Sirens, we have a very in-depth system for role-playing with NPCs. We know players love roleplay as much or more than combat in most cases across the RPGs that I've played and players I've talked to. Mm -hmm. So we've focused really hard on making the roleplay and the NPCs so much more fun and engaging than in other systems we've played. And we really leaned into that. The exceptions are politicians. They work like vending machines because politicians um, aren't really people in Song of Sirens. They are just things that are there that you must pay the proper toll to get what you want because that is how politicians work. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this amazing, wonderful role-playing system and you can do it for any NPC you want and they get likes and dislikes and the hobby and there's relationship levels and there's benefits you get to role-playing with them and then as soon as they get elected to a position of power, all of that freezes until they leave the power. <laughs> So you have to get favors. And with the political darling, anytime you get two or more favors at once, you get an additional favor. So one way you can get favors from politicians is uh, schmoozing. Which would mean just like, oh, you take, you know, a couple politicians and you throw a little party and you specifically invite them. And then while they're at this big extravagant party that you're throwing, you're chatting with them and you roll a charm check and you try and get them to go along with whatever it is you're trying to do giving yourself a raise, pardoning somebody, raising your military budget, building a new shipyard, starting a war, ending a war, whatever it is. But if you have political darling, it's like, oh yeah, you invite those two people and you get a favor from each of them, but you're just so charismatic and so good at manipulating these skeevy politicians that, oh hey, uh, you know, politician Larry, I didn't even invite that guy, but he showed up to my party because I'm so famous for throwing these cool parties and cool. I got a favor from him too. Cause I'm just the, the political darling. Mm -hmm. So no, I will, I will admit that I've met, I've messed around with alternate history and one of the, I suppose I could, I suppose I could make this work within song of sirens. One particular concept that I ended up exploring and I've done this multiple times with mixed results and tried to do it in, in certain video games with terrible results is the is the question? What if Fran, what if Archduke Ferdinand survived? Mm. And because I built it, I built it around the idea that there's a, the sad irony of his assassination was that was that Franz was not like his father. He. Actually, he actually wanted to push for for a series of reforms that would turn the Austria-Hungarian Empire into a United States of Austria-Hungary, and give more than just the Germans and Hungarians any um, actual political pull. And the pr now would that would that stop World War One? No. <laughs> Europe was a powder keg at that point in time, just waiting to go off. It was just a matter of what was going to set it off. Um, the way I envisioned that alternative campaign is that what ended up happening was a um, Austro-Hungarian civil war with between those who were those who were willing to side with the uh, side with Franz and those who were willing to side with his father. Um, and then th and then things just escalated from there. You still end up having World War One, but with a di but with a different 
um, set of circumstances. Since the whole reason things ended up going as far as they did was because of how international relationships worked. You know, you go to war, I'll go to war with you, and th and multiply that about 24 times. And I, I suppose it, it would take a it would take a bit of finagling, but I could see myself um, doing that with Song of Sirens. I'll just tell you right now that kind of scenario is absolutely something Song of Sirens is built to support. Mm -hmm. uh, the only things you'd have to do is you'd have to obviously move back the start date of the campaign uh, to whatever day you think um, things would start to get interesting for the campaign. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to reassemble some of the nations that exist at the time, redraw some maps, take away some colonies from some countries, give them back to some other people, merge some minor nations back together. But uh, in terms of, say, rebuilding Austria-Hungary or the Ottoman Empire and some of those nations that don't exist anymore by 1930 and then having a campaign with them, you absolutely can. Mm -hmm. Song of Sirens, it comes pre-built with 25 different alternate history campaigns uh, written out as concepts uh, within it that players can use, or like what you just said, they can make up something entirely their own. Yeah. Song of Sirens is built to be very, I guess, kind of sandboxy, and it just gives you a lot of the rules for, okay, when I do this, how does that play out? The analogy so I often <laughs> use is you're giving players the um, blue bucket of Legos. Exactly, exactly. Because um, Aust is Austria hungry in game? Uh, no, it's 1930. That nation had disappeared by then. Mm -hmm. Are all of the pieces of Austria hungry still in game? More or less. Um, Austria is in game, Hungary's in game, Yugoslavia is in there. It's just like you could reassemble the nation of Austria hungry or say reassemble the Ottoman Empire or mm -hmm. countries like that that you know don't exist anymore by 1930. Mm -hmm. You can reshape things uh, however you want. And 1930 is the recommended start for a Song of Sirens campaign, but it can start earlier or later um, as players desire. There's nothing stopping them from going back further because basically all of the starting ships in game were more World War I era, and then players are just scrambling to replace them as quickly as possible with more modern and objectively better counterparts. Yeah. So, with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as the total page count for the project? So, that number is a little bit a little bit difficult to just show, but oh, I know I know a quick way to figure that out. Let me get you an exact page count. I don't know how to do that. The page count for the book, Calvin. I got it, my love. Okay. Uh, Hi. So, he, yes, my wife is uh, here in the room. She likes to sit close by to me while I do interviews or live streams or anything like that. Uh, so, for the rules themselves, it is just a little over 400 pages. Though there are a lot of, obviously, like spaces mm -hmm. and whatnot, and that would be 400 pages in like your standard, like if you printed it out on a printer with sp standard paper, it'd be 400 pages. It's not like a big D and D book sized 400 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, there is an additional almost 500 pages that is just warships that we have statted out for players. We have over 200 historically accurate, to the best of our abilities, warships already free to play in game and there is a system for players to create their own custom ships as well mm -hmm. so with the, now with that in mind I should have asked this earlier but there's a lot there are a lot of um, there's a concept I've often talked about that I call all roads lead to Rome that being mm -hmm. a central die system that is that is utilized, or a central resolution system that's utilized for those cases that where die aren't involved, of what of how things are how things are supposed to work, and then adding exceptions to that, whether that be mm -hmm. the D10 die pool you see in World of Darkness, or the or the um the d20 blackjack that I've nick that I've nicknamed the victory point system in fading suns there's always that one mechanic that is the primary form of resolution um 
Hence, all roads lead to Rome. What would be the Rome in the case of Song of Sirens? The die used most commonly in Song of Sirens will be a d20. Mm -hmm. It is what you'll use for your effectively skill checks, you know, it's, whether it's a body check to survive your ship exploding, or a wit check to um, be able to, like, remember an important piece of history, or a charm check to, um, like, I'd have an entertaining evening with someone in order to gain relationship points with them. And additionally, whenever ships attack, whether it's with their main battery guns, aircraft, or torpedoes, it will be a D20 plus a set of modifiers set out in game. Uh, and the exception to that is we do use a lot of D100s for rolling on specific charts. Uh, for example, whenever you hit an enemy ship in combat, we decided not to have ships just have like one big health blob. We just, it kind of bugs me to see that in games. It's not particularly realistic. Uh, so whenever you land a hit on an enemy ship, you roll a D100 to see where on that enemy ship you hit it because each sector has its own HP and they're all armored differently as well. So one sector will have a lot better armor than another. Uh, we also use D100s for, as I referenced previously, the World Events chart. And one that we have found to be so fun, we have a nautical nonsense chart uh, that has, uh, I believe, 199 different events. So whenever you are, the most common thing you'll do whenever your fleet leaves port is you are trying to sail to a destination. And whenever you spend a week sailing somewhere, you roll a, another D100 to see what encounter you have while you're out. Mm -hmm. And on the open sea, the most common encounter you're going to get is nothing. Because even though there's lots of you know monsters and weather events and cool biomes and enemy ships and allied ships and all this kind of stuff out there, the ocean is huge. So the most common thing you're going to encounter is nothing. But we didn't want players to be like, oh, nothing happens again. I guess I'll just take my free time and then we'll keep traveling. So every time you encounter nothing, what happens in game is if nothing happens during the week to keep the crew's attention, like fighting a monster or spotting an enemy fleet, or if nothing happens, the crew gets bored and gets up to some kind of dumb nonsense that the Admiral then has to deal with. And we have 199 different nautical nonsense events that can happen in-game. Mm -hmm. um, some examples of them are, uh, for like a good example, it could be that one of your sirens that you're traveling with comes to you with a problem that they want your help with. Uh, and then you get to solve a little problem with them, you might be able to gain some relationship points. That'd be like an example of a good one. Um, a neutral one, uh, kind of leaning bad is one of them on there is you can wake up one day and you know, just stick your admiral legs over your bed and put your feet in your boots and realize that your boot laces are missing. One of your sailors just stolen your boot laces for no good reason and now you have to try and track them down because you don't have any functional shoes. Mm -hmm. All the way to some of the worst ones which can be something along the lines of you're walking around your ship you're taking stock of everything, making sure the crew are in ship shape, and you go to the powder magazines um, to make sure that everything is neat and tidy in there, and you find a sailor smoking. Mm -hmm. Now you have to deal with that situation. <laughs> so, it'll never be something that's like, it immediately directly negatively impacts you, like not a lot it's never going to cause a ship to explode, or cause an admiral to die, or lose money necessarily, but it's it's just, it's like, a, what nonsense did you have to deal with that week since nothing happened and the crew of 18 to 25-year-olds got bored? Mm-hmm. Because I've, 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 kn I've known some people who've, ser who've served, and they have interesting stories. Uh, I've, I've never met a serviceman who didn't have interesting stories of people getting up to some shenanigans, so we thought that was fun and realistic. <sighs> so... Um, mm -hmm. As a as a final note, as a final note, um, I know that you've been play testing this for for quite a while, but do you have plans on putting out a public demo in the near future? 
Well, the system as is, is complete. So we have a version of the system, our 1.00 version that we are satisfied with, and we have already sold a few advanced copies of at a convention that we attended. Uh, but if people want to do some play testing for the system, we do have an application on our website, uh, songofsirenstttrpg.com. Uh, if people want to play test the site and try it out and have us uh, run a little bit of it for them um, to try out the mechanics or to test some things, then people can apply to do that. Additionally, if they just want to pick up the system for themselves to utilize it and get a hold of it, uh, we'll soon have an online store or a way to purchase the system for from us directly on our website. And people can support our Kickstarter where they can pre-order the post 1.00 release digitally or get a pre-order a physical copy of the book as well. The Kickstarter is primarily to give us the capital that we need to print the physical copies of the system. As selling digital copies is within our ability, but printing out a triple digit number of physical copies, which is what you need to make printing them feasible in a way to sell them and make you know a return on investment, we just don't have the capital for that because it's thousands of dollars to print dozens or a hundred plus of these books. And if you don't print at least a hundred of them, they become prohibitively expensive. And the only way that regular D&D &D books can cost what they cost is because they can have them printed in China and order in excess of 1,500 of them at a time. And we're not even trying to do that. We just want to be able to use our local print shop to... Mm -hmm. enough of our physical books for us to start selling them both online and in person at conventions and things that we'd like to attend. So those would be the avenues for anybody who wants to try out the system. Our... And we will have a YouTube campaign uh, hopefully uploaded within a week or two uh, where we will be going through an Italian campaign called The Heavens Open where people can see what a full uh, Song of Sirens campaign looks like uh, starting from session zero up to its eventual conclusion. Mm -hmm. And I will be lo I'll be looking forward to that. So with, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Of course, it's been so fun chatting with you and you ask very good questions. Uh, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Get zoom tight. Thank you. <laughs> so there's my cute, lovely wife back there listening to this little interview. Uh, she's had such a great impact on this project. It absolutely never would have happened if not for her. And a lot of the very special and unique role-playing elements of the system uh, do come down to her. Things like the Vices and Virtues system for player admirals, um, and the relationship levels and RP system uh, that the game features so heavily are all thanks to her. Mm -hmm. And to anyone who wants to add a bit more flair and purpose behind uh, getting close to NPCs or wants a good NPC generator to make more fleshed out in-depth NPCs. The role-playing mechanics for Song of Sirens were built to be modular. So if you buy the system as is, you can take the role-playing RP mechanics from Song of Sirens, directly transplant, directly transplant them into any other D20 system easily, and even other like D10 or D6 systems probably wouldn't be very difficult at all. Mm-hmm. So, and with, the, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty mm -hmm. more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.